wonderful insights uh, that I will not try to repeat for you today because it would bore you. Um, one of the moments when I had a chance to watch yesterday uh, the OECD economist who used to work for the government of Ireland was talking about the complexities of European Union rules. And I kind of, it got me to thinking uh, about the challenge that we face in the development sphere as we seek to do what is really the primary purpose, it seems to me, of development, which is to strengthen institutions so that uh, nations and civil society can operate on their own uh, with a positive relationship um, that produces peace and prosperity and all of the good things that we, we seek uh, in the development process. Uh, it reminded me of uh, Max Weber's warnings uh, over a century ago where he talked a great deal about the, the possible threat that bureaucracy might pose to democracy. Um, that in fact, uh, bureaucratic practice which is designed to sustain itself uh, could take over and uh, eliminate creativity and to create problems for the interaction between people and governments. Indeed, um, they can make uh, state institutions rigid. Uh, they can, of course, as was suggested yesterday by our Irish friend, uh, make rules and regulations highly complex and beyond the ability of the people uh, to fully understand and participate in them. I think, uh, therefore, that what I want to say today, uh, I hope isn't too provocative, but I want to raise a question uh, about the impact of uh, uh, global rules and regulations on democracy, um, stimulated somewhat by Danny Roderick's book called The Globalization Paradox, where he actually suggests that uh, democracies themselves are threatened by the inhibitions that are being presented by international institutions on trade and finance, uh, inhibitions against, for example, creating uh, industrial policies that work, uh, inhibitions against certain activities to protect infant industries uh, and the like um, as they develop. And I don't raise these negative thoughts uh, just to be provocative. Uh, I raise them because there is very strong evidence in the development community that in fact our efforts at institution building have not succeeded to the extent we would like. It seems so simple that all we need to do is transfer knowledge uh, and the good practices of successful states uh, will be adopted uh, by developing countries and they will go on to, to peace, prosperity, and uh, the welfare of their people. Um, now, there is a role for knowledge sharing, and that is undeniable. And clearly, that is a central part of the effort we are making here at the OECD uh, to, uh, to develop a strategy, a development strategy, that would enable the OECD to take some of the best uh, of its ideas and, uh, and spread them to non-OECD countries, uh, countries that really badly need uh, to share those ideas. But is this enough, is the question. Um, OECD itself is inhibited because uh, it's not a development agency. It doesn't have people in the field nor does it have money to spend uh, in terms of grants. So the policies that we develop here need to be 
particularly sensitive to the challenges of developing countries if indeed we're going to have a strategy that is viable. And I think that the most important aspect of the development strategy, as many of you pointed out yesterday, is this notion that OECD countries need to adapt to the changes in the global economy, the changes in the global political system, and that we can learn as much from countries that have succeeded, uh, both economically and politically, as we can share uh, with developing countries that are still in that process of development. Adam Smith once wrote, little else is required to carry a state to the highest level of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. Now this might be an appealing line for members of the Tea Party in the United States, but it doesn't quite work uh, today in a world of all of these external complexities. What is missing from our effort to strengthen public institutions? Why is our success rate so low in this area? Now, the Busan Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, um, a major effort which included 160 countries, civil society, the private sector, um, contains some answers here. A great deal of emphasis as the development community has placed uh, for many years on local ownership. But there was also emphasis placed on participation and accountability. Busan reminded us, the Busan document that was approved by all of those countries, reminded us that promoting human rights, democracy, and good governance is an integral part of the development process. Those words came from the Millennium Dec Declaration that all nations endorsed. And it wasn't simply part of the Busan document, but it was reinforced. Yet I have to say uh, today, after we have lived with, for example, the Arab Spring for a year, that development agencies themselves and international organizations seem to have constantly shortchanged this essential in ingredient uh, of the develop in the development mix. We fund democratic uh, democracy governance programs rather episodically. We did a good job of funding the transition from colonialism. We did a good job of funding the transition from communism. Uh, but we've taken uh, baby steps in responding uh, in the MENA region. And now uh, it seems to me that the arrest of these NGOs, these non-governmental organizations in Egypt uh, may scare us away altogether. I hope that doesn't happen um, because there is a real need for active participation. There's a lot of attention being paid in Egypt to the Americans and the Germans and the OECD NGOs that are, have been arrested or are being sheltered by their embassies. But the people that stood in the cage at the courtroom the other day were Egyptians. They worked for the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and others. Um, they were Egyptians, and there were many, many Egyptians, according to the president of NDI, job that I once held. The NDI uh, seminars uh, touched uh, some 15,000 Egyptians, including the Muslim Brotherhood. And so there were many Egyptians, despite the wave of nationalism that's going on now, that were affected by the ideas that were presented. This was obviously knowledge sharing of a kind that was much needed and desired by, on the part of the Egyptians. So I hope that we don't abandon efforts uh, to share experiences. The Busan Agreement is based on shared principles. It is a voluntary agreement. 
but I think the emphasis ought to be placed on shared principles. And civil society is as much our partner uh, as our governments. I think that what happened in Busan, Korea in involving the civil society in a very positive way was almost revolutionary when it comes to international meetings of that sort. There were some 500 representatives of civil society there. My friend Tony Tuham was there as a member of the negotiating group. Very interesting when civil society, which Tony had the challenge of having some 1,000 or more people telling him which amendments he should offer uh, during the Sherpas meeting, and governments sitting there knowing they have to go back to capitals to gain approval of the kinds of things that were being presented. It was a challenge, but it's a challenge that worked out, and civil society's point of view was very much uh, represented. And one thing they insisted upon was that when we talk about the relationship with other societies in the development process, that we not simply talk about the relationship of one government to another, but rather include civil society and the private sector uh, in the process. Now, in my view, we will not succeed in building budget systems, tax systems, regulatory systems, and efficient public administration without creating as well the institutions that encourage debate, active participation, elective syst election systems, parliamentary uh, processes, political parties, and of course vibrant civil societies. To me that is what has been missing uh, as we look at our record with respect to institution building. All of that is included in the Busan document. It, is, it should be a vital part of the global partnership which we're in the process of building. And it should be a vital part of the OECD development uh, strategy as well. I've mentioned Danny Roderick's book. Also would uh, cite to you a book called Pillars of Prosperity, the Political Economics of Development Clusters by Besley and, and Person. The authors here assemble the evidence uh, to show that countries enjoy peace and prosperity when they have, have evolved cohesive political institutions that promote common interests. There's a lot of literature on this subject, and yet we don't seem to pay as much attention as I believe we should uh, in the development community. And if OECD's development strategy ignores uh, that self-evident truth, it will become part of the problem and not part of the solution. So with those uh, words of warning, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce a person who has himself, with his own hands and his own brain, helped to evolve uh, the system in the country of Poland, who's worked not only on the institutions of effective governance but worked on the political institutions as well during the transition in Poland. He's the Polish ambassador to the OECD, Paweł Wojciechowski. Did I pronounce your name properly? I pronounce it differently every time, and no one seems to know the difference. He is also the chair of the Development Center. Paweł, please. Going to, I was going to touch the magic bell again, but uh, so I'm so privileged to opening the second day of, uh, of the Global Forum Development, Brian, and uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here with you. And uh, of course the dark and, and the deaf are, I would say, the twins. We are the twins, Brian, and uh, of course you are one year older because the DACA is one year older, uh, the DEF Development Center is, uh, 
is celebrating this 50th anniversary this week. That's very important to all of us. But we very much on this time work very closely together, the two uh, important uh, institutions with this development cluster of the OCD, uh, to put together the development strategy. And as I am eager to, to hear, uh, to listen to what Professor Pritchett will present today, I will uh, induce uh, further our thinking into the development direction. I would like to focus a little bit on the strategy. Um, well, as uh, Professor Pritchard eloquently documented throughout, throughout his economic, uh, economic, uh, econo uh, uh, throughout his work, economic growth is the only one aspect of development. Another dimension of development, and it was eloquently emphasized, emphasized by, by, by Brian, are the expansion of government capabilities, the institutional building. Uh, Brian mentioned the experiences the actual experiences on the ground, the field, um, as I had them in Poland during the transformation times. And in fact, you know, it's not about growth only. When we did the transformation, it was not about growth. Nobody thought about the growth, the GDP growth. Everybody thought about structural changes, institution building. I work one in UP on this program that was called the Market Economy, Economy Institution Development Program. So this is actually what it's all about, about uh, changing institutions and very importantly also uh, promoting, inducing behavioral change and it's an important role for civic societies uh, that they play today even more importantly with uh, Facebooks and internet and communication that's ever increasing more importantly and we don't really know and the governments don't know how to deal with that. So, uh, but just reflecting on the Polish experiences, I can say, you know, although many other countries uh, underwent the transition, uh, the OCD was very helpful. We had some uh, good uh, ideas were coming from OCD 15 years ago, but all the tracks were different. Uh, there was no, as it was said, and many of, of speakers yesterday said, there was no one path no one trajectory, no one single growth development model. And so I'd like to emphasize the two important uh, uh, lessons that we can, uh, that we can see in, uh, in, the, in the draft of the strategy on development of the OCD. Uh, first, it's the important uh, lesson that we have to uh, build endogenous government capabilities this is a crucial element for development. And the transformation, of course, is a, a very good example. Actually, with all the complexities that we have today, it's even more important, because I could say building a country from central plan economy to a market economy maybe was easier than solving the euro area crisis today with all these complexities. Uh, and second one is that we have to look for for experiences from other countries, but we should not min mimic them, but also share and understand how they work and why they didn't work, and uh, don't take, don't, we should not take a shortcuts. So this is what is very important uh, in the OCD mode of work, and it's being uh, presented uh, to the OCD community, uh, uh, to, to, to the C community, community as, um, as very important uh, uh, comparative advantage that OCD has. Uh, so within this development, development cluster, we can say that, uh, uh, you know, it was, I've heard this often at times again, you know, several times that OCD has this comparative advantage. I would like to leverage the D letter the development letter in its name. And in fact, uh, uh, the only thing that come to me as a conclusion is that we, uh, with the development cluster, have, of course, concentrated on aid, but at the same time on the, all the instruments. 
to build, build those capacities. In addition to that, we came to the conclusion after many, many years of working that knowledge sharing, uh, mutual learning is the way to go. So it's pretty much, this is the comparative advantage of the OCD, of its uh, uh, development cluster, of the member-driven committees. And uh, I think I'm very positive about uh, also the role of development center in it, uh, which is the organization that works on equal footing with, uh, with non-OCD and OCD developing and developed countries, small and big countries, in one center, and we share the knowledge for last 50 years. So that's a good, good example to follow. And that's, uh, that's a big change, not only in this uh, cluster, in the development center, but I believe also in the OCD. So uh, let me conclude this with, uh, by introducing Professor Lant Pritchett. He's a well-known development scholar from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. John Kennedy, as you may know, uh, is the father, we say, of the development center as well. Uh, Mr. Preacher, Pritchett is also a non-resident fellow of the Center for Global uh, Development. Uh, he is also, does have not only the distinguished academic career, but also he worked on the ground, in particular with the World Bank. We just chat, chat about that. Uh, with a lot of uh, on-the-ground experiences uh, serving in uh, India, Indonesia, and Argentina. We are honored to have him today. Without further ado, let me give the floor to Professor Pritchard. Please. Thanks for the um, kind introduction. I think I'm mic'd up so that I'm not uh, frozen to the podium. If we could load, I have a PowerPoint that has uh, pictures of snakes and puppies and stuff. Um, so, I, so you don't want to, the, the pictures will be entertaining even if the talk isn't. Um, I will address quite directly some of the questions that uh, Brian uh, posed, which is about building the capability of the state. Um, because a lot of our discussions have been about, in the development on strategy, have been what the state should do, or even how the state should be governed in terms of how the peep citizens should go about controlling what the state decides to do. But there's also a huge issue in what is the state actually capable of doing. And I guess a lot of what you, where you stand depends on where you sit. And for three years, I sat in India, which is a very interesting country, in the sense that all of the things that Brian listed about democracy and political parties and free press and civil society and everything else exist in spades in India. Uh, you can't want a freer press than India's free press. You can't want more vibrant political parties than uh, India's political parties. You can't want more contested elections in which they're unlike American elections, there's actually an anti-incumbency bias. So congressmen don't stay in office for, uh, for ages and ages in India. They get turned over all the time. So on the face of it, you would think if those were the things that led to a capable state that delivered good services, India would be a terrific sort of uh, government and that it would sort of have a well-capable state that was actually delivering services. And instead, if you look at India, uh, it's quite a puzzle because in spite of its economic growth, its malnutrition rates are higher than most African countries. Its uh, learning levels in its primary schools are lower than many African countries. Its vaccination rates, a basic core governmental function, are lower than nearly all African countries. And so somehow these have yet to combine into a truly capable state. Now, that experience of living in Indonesia was accompanied by traveling around parts of South Asia. Uh, and I remember visiting Afghanistan as part of a World Bank mission on governance in Afghanistan. And uh, the World Bank team in Afghanistan was confined 
to working only from the office of the World Bank. They literally couldn't leave the building because of security concerns. And the main issue that they were dealing with was designing like a reform of the civil service in terms of pay grades and occupational classifications. And I remember thinking, there's a phrase that you may have heard called rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And as I was watching what the World Bank was doing in Afghanistan, I was thinking, this is rearranging the umbrellas in the drinks in the cup holders on the deck chairs of the Titanic. You just can't possibly imagine that of all the things that need to happen for Afghanistan to be a peaceful and prosperous society with a capable state, that getting the precise descriptions of what a level 15 bureaucrat and what a level 16 bureaucrat do is an integral part of building the state, and yet that is what we were devoting substantial time and attention to. So partly today's presentation arises out of those paradoxes, and I sort of want to talk through four things, and I hope I have time to get through all four. The first is that whenever we just start any discussion about development, um, we should start from the premise that in many of the key dimensions of human well-being, the last 50 years have been the best 50 years in the history of mankind by a large multiple. So before we get too obsessed with failure, we should start with success, amazing success, uh, and, 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 and much more robust than success than we would have thought. But to some extent, I'm going to argue we're a victim of our own success, because the areas in which the development endeavor have been successful, I will argue, have primarily been logistical. So to the extent that the problems of development were reducible to the logistical type of tasks that a Weberian bureaucracy could address, we've actually been fantastically successful in meeting them. But where it actually required a higher capability state, a state that was able to actually make decisions and implement them in complex areas that required the agents of the state to be actively engaged and thoughtful in what they did, we've been unsuccessful, and in fact we've worked ourselves into what we call capability traps, where in the attempt to build the Bavarian bureaucracy that has delivered the logistical successes, we prevent the emergence of true state, state capability. And then finally I'd like to conclude with at least some principles of ways out of the capability trap, the ways out of the fact that our efforts at building state capability building the capability of the state to actually not just formulate plans, but actually execute them and lead to successful outcomes has been, ha has been the least successful part of development efforts over the years. So just start with the amazing success. Um, I think a, a statistic that I find just absolutely staggering in terms of the progress of the developing countries over the last 50 years is that the least successful developing countries now have actually more years of schooling of their labor force than France did in 1960. So Haiti, which we uniformly think of as a basket case, legitimately so, actually has higher average years of schooling in 2010 than France had in 1960, after which France was widely considered to be a world leading power. Um, so the success in expanding the years of schooling. So the entirety of human history up to 1950 had only led the developing world to have two years of schooling per person in the labor force. In just the 60 years since, we've gone from two years to 7.2 years. That's amazing. That's just, so if we take all of human history of the 6,000 years or however you date hum, you know, recorded human history, education had only reached in a very elite few even as late as 1950, and basically now we've universalized basic education in two generations. Fantastic success. Um, uh, similar things are true of, now, now the fantastic success has a kind of fantastic element to it, which is you might have thought, well, of course we were successful at education because we had democracy and we had some good governments, we had governments that cared about people, 
But it turns out we kind of got success uniformly, meaning if you group countries by governance indicators and say, oh, well, of course we had good education success in democracies, but non-democracies didn't do so well. No, that's just not true. If we take the best third of countries by democracy and the worst third of countries by democracy, actually the non-democracies had schooling expand a little more. If we take countries without civil liberties and countries with civil liberties, they had education expand by almost exactly the same amount. If we take countries with corruption and countries without corruption, they had schooling expand by almost exactly the same amount. So to have universal success, it means it's universal, which means even the bad guys manage to get, wrap their heads around doing some good things, like schooling. Similar things are true um, of, uh, of uh, infant mortality or life expectancy. So if you look at the gains in life expectancy on the left of the figure, you can see the history of Sweden. And you can see that to get from about 40 years life expectancy in eight, prior to 1850 to 60, 65 years of life expectancy took Sweden about 100 years. Whereas if you look at the progress over sort of the period in which the OECD DAC has been in existence, no cause and effect, of course, but just of, of interest, um, there's been spectacular success. And not only has there been spectacular success in places that we think of as being sort of robust, kind of pretty solid, economic growth, not a lot of conflict, like South Korea and Indonesia, who have had life expectancy go up by 23 and 28 years, respectively. But Bangladesh, which usually isn't often typically triumphed as a success of democracy or capability, has had life expectancy increase by 23 years. Senegal, a sort of in many ways typical African country that has not had a lot of robust economic growth, has also had life expectancy expand by 22 years. So again, we've had amazingly rapid and amazingly uniform progress in certain key human development indicators. So now, so the question is, how do we reconcile amazing success with the frustrating, the sense of frustration and failure around other aspects of building institutional capability? So I want to talk about institutional capability, but before I talk about institutional capability, I have to build a taxonomy. And it's going to be an analytical taxonomy. And an analytical taxonomy, a taxonomy just helps us dis differentiate what's like what, right? So if we look at these, wow, this is a little sensitive. So if we look at these sort of creatures in the world, which, which is more alike? Well, on some level, the top two, someone's boy, the top two are a lot alike, right? But one's a dog and one's a wolf. So they're actually not the same species. So in terms of species, they're not alike. In terms of habitat, in terms of external experience, external experience, they both live in Alaska. They both look a lot alike. But those two, <laughs> this ridiculous looking white creature and that <laughs> proud looking creature, <laughs> those two are actually the same species. So on the taxonomy of species, they're more alike. If we think of the taxonomy of an ecosystem, the wolf and the bear are both predators and serve kind of the same role in an ecosystem. So if we say what's more alike, we have to think, well, for what purposes and in what way? So what I want to talk about, so we can think the same thing when we start talking about the, the kinds of things government do. Governments do a broad array of things. And I want a taxonomy of those things by their analytical characteristics that will reveal to me what the capability it will take for the government to do those things is. So if we look at these four pictures, these are both, this is a primary school, that's a university, that's a primary healthcare clinic, that's a hospital. Which is more alike? Well, if we were doing a taxonomy of sector or purpose, we might say a hospital and a primary clinic are alike because they both have the objective of addressing health. But if we think in terms of the complexity or the capability or the organization, we might think that tertiary facilities, universities and hospitals, are actually going to be more alike in terms of how they operate 
than primary facilities. So we might think a clinic and a school are more alike. So what I want you to do is I want you to write down, everybody take out a pen. Pen. <laughs> Everyone has a piece of paper. At the very least, you should have some conference schedule on which you can write on, you can write on my photo or Brian's bio or something. That gives you plenty of space. Um, I, just want to, <laughs> I just want you to write down one activity as specific as you can think of it in a specific place. So I've given lots of examples by what I mean. So I don't mean governance in Africa. I mean property tax collection in Cali, Colombia, right? And I don't mean, you know, building institutional capability. I mean, you know, procurement in Kenya. Okay, so write down that activity. Is everybody writing down? I can see you. I can see you're not writing down. I mean, come on. <laughs> so everybody must be interested in some activity, specific activity, right? That you're either working with, that you're concerned about, OK? OK, once you've written it down, <laughs> I want you to turn to the person on your right and tell them what you've written down. So see, I'm, I'm calling your bluff here. <laughs> So turn to the person on the right and just what is it that you're interested in? What is it that you kind of are thinking about these days? Okay? <laughs> Did you pick something? <laughs> okay. OK, now, I've done that just to focus your mind, because now, as I develop my taxonomy, I want you answering these four questions about your activity that you've written down and told to your neighbor. And I had you tell it to your neighbor so that you can't change it to make it easier for you to answer the questions as I ask them, see? You know, you're pre-committed to stick to the same answer, because I know even if you wrote it down, you'd change, your, you'd change it if it got hard for you. So I want you to answer these four questions, which I think are central to a taxonomy of what's like what. The first question is, is the successful accomplishment of what you've written down transaction intensive? Does it require lots and lots of agents to do it or do only a few agents? So for instance, central banking, a few dozen people can make the decisions. Giving vaccinations requires thousands and thousands of people. Setting curriculum is a few dozen experts. Actually teaching requires thousands and thousands of teachers. So the first question, and just start ticking these off. Is my activity transaction intensive or not transaction intensive? Does it take a few dozen people to get it right and essentially implement it? Or does it actually require hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of agents out in the field doing it to accomplish it? OK. The second thing is, is the successful accomplishment of your activity locally discretionary? Now, this is a little complicated. What locally discretionary means is, do the agents in carrying out the successful accomplishment of your task, does it require them to operate based on local <laughs> knowledge? Or can they follow some really simple script? So is what they need to do quite narrowly tailored? So vaccinations, again, is an example of something that's transaction intensive. But it's not really locally discretionary. You grab a kid, they're a small kid, you vaccinate them. It's really simple, right? I, I know it's more complicated than that. Any public health expert in the room, OK, forgive me. But ambulatory curative care. Being a doctor is super local discretionary because each patient shows up and says something different. And what you need to do has to respond to the local conditions. OK? I'll give some examples. The third sort of thing is, <clears throat> is, what you, is what you're trying to accomplish based on a known technology? <coughs> Does somewhere in the world there exist kind of a handbook of it? Right? Or does it actually require your agents to kind of innovate in local contexts? So building roads, we know how to build roads. There's handbooks of like 
depth of asphalt and concrete based on load and heave and big thick ones. I've seen them on bookshelves, you know, handbook of construction engineering. It's kind of a known technology building a road, right? Whereas promoting breastfeeding is kind of really, there is no known technology for doing it. There's lots of people with different ideas about how one might do it. Or for instance, promoting weight loss, right? If there was a known technology for promoting weight loss, you know, I wouldn't have these buttons sometimes going like this. I would be much thinner, right? Because I would adopt the known technology. The last question about your activity, is it, is it high stakes? And what I mean by high stakes kind of is, will someone pay your agents to not do it to them? <laughs> so tax collection is intrinsically a high stakes activity for your agents. Because your agents will be asked by taxpayers to not, in fact, collect the tax that's owed, but collude with them to sort of declare some lower tax, OK? So let me just give examples. And I want to be clear that these, once we have these taxonomy, it cuts across activities within sectors. If this isn't a sector thing that health is health sector has these characteristics and the financial sector has those characteristics. Rather, within every sector, there's lots of different sort of activities. So the iodization of salt's just a policy. It's implementation light. You can decide to do it. You can, you know, there's a few producers of salt. You can make them do it. Boom, it's done, right? Vaccinations is what I'll call logistical. It's implementation intensive, but easy meaning there's a known technology, it's not locally discretionary, it takes lots of agents, but even, you know, it's pretty simple to do. Ambulatory turn, curative care is what I call implementation intensive service delivery, which is it takes lots of agents. There is a known technology. Medicine is kind of a science. I mean, kind of a science. There's a lot of art to it, but it's kind of a science. But it's, it's locally discretionary. What has to happen to each patient depends on characteristics of that patient that are only observed by the doctor, right? Um, then the regulation of private providers, let's say the government wanted to regulate private healthcare providers, that's what I would call implementation intensive imposition of obligations. And that gets harder because it's high stakes. So when governments go out, to sort of judge a hospital or judge a clinic in the private sector, the private sector is willing to undermine the incentives of the agents to not give them the rating that they might, in fact, deserve. See what I'm saying? So this is a different thing because in the ambulatory curative care, the patient receiving the service actually wants the service. In regulatory activities, you know, just think of policing, right? The client of police does not want the policing. <laughs> Right? The guy the policeman's arresting uh, is, you know, in terms of the direct interaction of the service provider, he'd just assume the policeman not arrest him. Okay? And then finally, there's a category of things which I call wicked hod. And it has to be pronounced in that way because this is a Boston localism where I've been based. Wicked hod, which wicked just means very in this context, it doesn't mean evil. And what that means is these are things that are transaction intensive. You have to have lots of agents doing stuff. Locally discretion means it's hard to actually observe whether your agents are doing the right thing. Might be high stakes, and there's no known technology for doing it. So you actually require your agents spontaneously innovating in the field in order to accomplish your objective. So we need spontaneous innovation. OK. Just I could walk through this in the financial sector again. Same thing. Inside the financial sector, there are things that are policy that are implementation light, like the central bank setting the discount rate or deciding to devalue the currency. There's you know, logistical tasks, like the cross-bank settlement of payments that's kind of a little bit tricky, but it's logistical, right? Um, there's lending to firms, which is implementation intensive service delivery. You, you, you actually have to say, should this guy get a loan or this guy not get a loan? And your local agent has to decide. There's the regulation of private banks. And then there's things like using the financial instruments to promote entrepreneurship, which is wicked hide. Because 
how you promote entrepreneurship is not a known technology. OK. So what I want you to do, so what we're trying to accomplish is like a taxonomy of activities that's kind of built up from first principles. So now what I want you to do is just think through the answers to these questions about the activity that you wrote down and told to your neighbor and see if you can clearly say what your activity is like. And I want you to tell your neighbor. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I think my activity is like this because I answer the questions in this way. Go ahead. Are you not ready? Come on, go ahead. You two. You two are sitting next to each other. Got to talk to each other now. <laughs> you two are sitting next to each other. <laughs> Wicked hard. Oh, absolutely. And Brian here is, in fact, following instructions by saying wicked hard. So <laughs> you're from Massachusetts. Are you? Yeah, you're sure you are. What? Imputation light. Imputation light. Policy. That's right. OK. OK. Has everybody kind of got in the mind what they're worried about and where it is on this? Now. The point is, we can, development consists of doing lots of different activities. And they fall into these different categories. And I'm not going to argue that getting the po implementation light policies, like having a reasonably valued exchange rate, are less important or more important than implementation service delivery, like primary schooling. But what I am going to argue is it takes different ways in thinking about the capability to do them. The capability of having an independent central bank that can set appropriate monetary policy is an entirely different notion of capability than having a system of primary education in which you can go out and educate kids, um, uh, in which kids actually show up at school and actually learn stuff. because. Independent central banks, it's been shown, given the right sort of insulation, the right sort of professional capability, not that very many trained people can actually guide a country reasonably well in terms of getting the macro sort of elements of central banking right. But that capability doesn't translate into a capability to, say, lend to firms. So you can simultaneously, simultaneously have a really strong central bank and really weak commercial banking because it requires very different kinds of capabilities to carry it out of the system. OK, so I, these are just my rankings where red means hard, green means easy. Um, so green in the known technology box just means it is a known technology. Um, red in the known technology box means it's not a known technology. OK, now, why am I setting all this up? I'm setting all this up because there can't be any lessons about capability that, in my mind, that cross this taxonomy. So if we say, we did this thing and we were really successful in getting vaccinations done, and therefore we're going to apply the same lessons of institutional capability to ambulatory curative care, it ain't going to work. It just isn't going to work. It's not the same kind of thing in some deep underlying level, right? And partly what has happened is that I'm getting this. Partly what has happened, my argument is that partly what has happened, and let me just skip to this, is that what we have been successful in development at over the last 50 years through fits and starts and by and large, and we can debate it back and forth. But so far, we've been pretty successful in getting some pretty good policies in place. And we've been really successful at getting logistics in place. And what we haven't been very successful at yet is getting the capabilities in place to carry out implementation intensive service delivery or implementation intensive imposition of obligations. And the problem is, is if you pretend 
that the same strategies and organizational approaches and capability building that got you good logistics will get you good innovation, it just ain't going to happen. So if you look at schooling, for instance, everything about getting butts in seats is logistical. Right? You want to get kids in school, right? Kids in school, logistical. Building a school, logistics. Hiring a teacher, logistics. Buying some chalk, getting it distributed to schools, logistics. It's all logistics. Teaching kids is implementation intensive. The teacher actually has to do the right thing for the children day in, day out, based on what's actually going on in the classroom. And if the teacher does, isn't pro properly motivated, isn't properly capable of doing it, and doesn't do it, kids just don't learn anything. So this is an example of, I mean, this is an example from India, one of the states of India, about the progress from year to year in extremely simple capabilities, and basically, over a year of primary schooling in the state of India, one out of every eight kids learns to add. So if you come into grade three not knowing how to add two numbers together, of eight kids that come into grade three not knowing how to add, only one will learn how to add in an entire year of schooling. That's disastrous. That's just disastrous, right? But it's the failure of taking a logistical approach to a problem that's entirely different in terms of the capability it requires, right? And what's tempting <laughs> is success. After all, if we've had success with a logistical approach, let's just continue the logistical approach. And the problem is, if the nature of what you have to do has gotten more sophisticated by your previous success, your previous successful strategy becomes irrelevant, becomes worse than irrelevant, in the sense that, I'm going the wrong way, okay, in the sense that, so then, so then just think about kind of state capability for policy implementation. What is it that your government does well, okay? So you wrote down an activity, right? And you wrote down a specific context, OK? Now think of that context that you wrote down. We can think of things within each sector that require low capability, meaning policy implementation with implementation light, logistics, and things that require a lot of capability. And then think of that across sectors. And so kind of what a high capability state means is that they can do a lot of sophisticated things. Right? Not only can they get kids in school, but their kids actually learn. And not only do kids kind of learn in primary school, but they probably have some pretty good universities. Not only do they do vaccinations well, but they probably do ambulance. If, if you're a prototypical sort of OECD European country, you probably not only have every kid vaccinated and have had for the last 50 years, you probably also have some pretty good health financing, health system things where probably if you have a broken leg, you can get it fixed. And probably not just a broken leg, you can probably get some heart surgeries done. And probably not just that, you've probably got a public health department that's probably got some campaigns to get people to stop smoking with some moderate success. So you're doing increasingly sophisticated things because you have higher and higher levels of state capability. See what I'm saying? So now you've arrayed what you were thinking about in terms of, is, of its capability requirements from policy or logistics to wicked hard. And now think, are you trying to do a wicked hard thing in places that in other domains don't even do logistics? See what I'm saying? Everybody understand what I'm saying? If you're trying to do something wicked hard in Haiti, you're going to fail. Because it just doesn't have the capability to do it, even if it has the capability to do logistics. So what we want to think about is, so one of the things that we have pointed out is that 
what's happened is, is that although states have been successful in logistical tasks, the general sort of particularly among the weakest countries in the world, just as Brian pointed out in the introductory remarks, what we've kind of left out is the general building of state capability. So they have not progressed in terms of the capabilities of what they're able to do. And if we just kind of do a calculation, this is just sort of a calculation. Let's take Somalia as the lowest state capability can be, which I think is a reasonable presumption because it has no state. Um, then just say, OK, where is Haiti on its measures of state capability? And we've done this for lots and lots of different measures, and this is all robust. Where is Haiti today relative to where Somalia was, um, to where Somalia is? And then you think, OK, the cumulative process of state capability building in Haiti has only led it to be that far from Somalia, which means it's growing very slowly, which means if we extrapolate its rate of growth and say, when is Haiti going to get to Singapore's level of capability at its current pace of building capability, the answer is about 2,000 years. It just ain't getting there, right? So unless there's something very different about the process of capability building, if we just continue business as usual with capability building, you know, no matter how you do these calculations, we do calculations for a variety of countries for a variety of indicators of state capability, and you basically just come up for the bottom countries in the world in state capability, at their current pace of progress, it's going to be hundreds and hundreds of years before they acquire sort of even uh, before they acquire high capability. And it's going to be, you know, generations before they develop even moderate capability. So this is what we refer to as a capability trap. You're in a situation in which you have the, in which these countries and lots of other countries are in stagnant levels of capability for very long periods of time. And hence there's no natural dynamic of the growth of capability. If there's no natural dynamic of the growth of capability, then the business as usual scenario continued out into the future will mean low capability far into the future. Am I running out of time? Is that what he was whispering? OK. Um, so I'm going to skip. Uh, wow, well, I'm time to sign up. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk about one thing, and then four principles, and then I'll sum up. So one of the key dangers of a lot of what's been done is what we call borrowing from sociologists of organization isomorphic mimicry. Isomorphic mimicry means I will gain in the natural world survival value by looking like something that's poisonous. Right? So this snake on the top is actually a venomous snake. If it bites you, you'll be sick or die. So people avoid it and that gives them survival value. The snake below, not poisonous. What has the snake below decided? The snake below has said, hmm, I could either develop some fangs and some venom and some ability to bite, or I could just look like another snake that has those things. And as long as I look like another snake that has those things, I get all the value with none of the cost. So a fair amount of what has passed for promoting capability has been encouraging incapable governments to look like capable governments, <laughs> right? As long as you adopt the civil service code of the United States in Afghanistan, well, then obviously Afghanistan has a higher capability government. As long as African countries adopt the same procurement codes as Denmark has, then obviously Africa has better procurement. No. The answer is no. <laughs> right? So, you know, if we look at, is this a school or is this the camouflage of a school? Well, if we don't measure learning, we can't tell. They can buy the desks, they can buy the books, they can have the teachers. But unless we actually have performance-based metrics, it's very difficult to know whether we're promoting outcomes or whether we're promoting isomorphic mimicry. An isomorphic mimicry is a technique you can use as a government 
to engage with donors, to engage with the international community for 50 years and not be any more capable than you were 50 years before in spite of engaged in 50 years of donor projects to build capability, in spite of 50 years of engaging in donor rhetoric because the donors have been satisfied with your looking like a state. Okay, so I'm gonna skip some other stuff and all of this would have changed your life if you had heard it, but. <laughs> <laughs> this may be, a, anyway, maybe you'll come hear me some other time. Okay, but I, I, do, I do wanna talk a bit because people complain that I'm too pessimistic about how to sabotage the camouflage, okay? How do you sabotage the camouflage? And I just want to talk about four principles, and I'll just give you the principles in another take, and day and time we'll go into them in depth. Which is, you want, I think we want to reorient ourselves to be problem driven rather than solution driven. So, as much as we say we're going to cooperate and transfer learning, are we transferring learning about forms? or are we transferring learnings about functionalities, right? So if we transfer, this is how we did it in terms of process, but we, you know, it's sort of like if we take a tree that's been very successfully growing in France and we cut it off of its roots and move it to another country, that tree will not grow because we've missed out on the key features and we've transferred the look of the tree without the real tree. The second is muddling through. There's got to be more space to authorize positive deviation. Paradoxically, we need to have more failure. We need to have more space for productive failure. Because the tendency of donor organizations is to authorize only what we're sure will work, or at the very least what we're sure won't get us in trouble if it doesn't work. So we do the same kind of project because we know that we won't get in trouble. Authorizing provative divination means taking risks and getting risks taken in intergovernmental cooperation <laughs> is really tough. The third thing is just think it's all about me. Where me is monitoring experiential learning and evaluation which is once we've authorized positive deviation, once we've defined a problem, we have continuous feedback on whether we're getting better at the problem. So rather than measure process compliance, we measure progress on problem solutions. And with rapid feedback loops, not three-year learning cycles, not eight-year learning cycles, but real learning cycles built into our projects. And finally, my, our view is only learning is learning. <laughs> What does that mean? That means I disbelieve that you can transfer learning. If you haven't learned it for yourself, you don't know it. And that's as true of collecting property taxes or educating kids or running industrial policy. So, not, so the, the sharing of learning is a very difficult thing. So if I can just conclude, um, I know I'm... I'm skipping all this stuff again. It would have been life-changing to hear it, but that's okay. I always prepare for the worst, which means I have a lot of time. Uh, okay. So let me just sort of caricature mainstream development versus what we call problem-driven iterative adaptation that would follow these four principles. Just think of what drives action, how do you plan for action, how do you set up fail feedback loops, and how you plan to scale. And the way in which mainstream development works is built in such a way that you can do it for decades and decades and it will survive and legitimate itself on isomorphic mimicry such that you will have lots, a whole series of successful projects and no successful building of capability at the, at the, at the end. So, um, so huge success, don't let ever, don't, I, I think sometimes the development community we built it, we beat ourselves up too much fantastically successful uh, at lots of things, but the success that the things we've been successful at has created a set of mechanisms that worked for those things that we have now outgrown. There is no more space in the world for improving vaccinations, really. 
There's no more space in the world for getting more kids into primary school, really. I mean, there's a few countries that we can mop up, but, but the agenda has to move to more sophisticated things, and for those more sophisticated things, we need higher levels of capability, and to build those levels of capability, we need a completely different approach to the building of capability than the one that has been successful in building our capability for logistics. Thank you very much. We uh, have time for a couple of questions, uh, we're told, so please, uh, I'm sure the, you want to direct them to the professor, but uh, we're all here. Yes. In the back, please. Get a microphone back there. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a really fascinating presentation. And uh, I'm working on uh, uh, democracy and electoral assistance. So I was very struck by the introductory remarks uh, by the two co-chairs about transition, uh, political transitions in multiple transition contexts, I would say, and also the role of uh, building um, political institutions as an important missing aspect or uh, underestimated aspect of a lot of what we have been doing over the last uh, decades. And uh, with the presentation of the professor, I think that we had also a very interesting um, uh, explanation of how uh, political dynamics within bureaucracies provide obstacles also to shift from the logistical to the implementation uh, levels. Um, I would make two comments. One is that also in the field of building political institutions, there is the same type of traps that can be seen in other uh, policy areas. Uh, so that uh, the same uh, reasoning applied to vaccinations is valid actually for uh, holding elections. There is a certain uh, logistical approach to uh, organizing political processes which is based on norms and procedures and doesn't necessarily take into account the uh, built-in incentives or disincentives and the camouflage that uh, the professor has mentioned about uh, uh, more uh, properly development uh, issues. That is the first point. And the second point is uh, actually the need to understand the context. I think that is an overall message that is really a prerequisite for uh, learning. So the attitude not to understand uh, contexts, but rather to run into policy prescriptions which are easier to uh, understand, also because of our own, um, how can we say, uh, disciplinary background. And the fact that we, uh, we are in the same circles. We are people who, who may attend uh, meetings like these ones, and we come more or less from the same environment, in a way. Uh, that is another limit that I think should be uh, addressed. And we have actually to think a little bit out of the box in order to uh, make that shift uh, that uh, the professor has mentioned. Thank you. I just want to make one point uh, about your comments. Um, those who can identify isomorph isomorphic uh, mimicry, uh, the, the snake that doesn't really have the, the poison, are the families and people at the local level. And therefore, uh, it seems to me, if they don't have a voice uh, in the development process, then you, you can't really identify. It's, it's more unlikely that foreign development agencies are going to recognize the, the, the mimicry. Thank you. Just a very short question. According to your four criteria, would you please mention some emerging countries whose government are really competent instead, instead of looking competent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
a very interesting and provocative uh, in, uh, presentation. My question relates to the uh, only learning is learning. And now we are here in the OECD and uh, we are developing a new development strategy which is very much about knowledge sharing, mutual learning, as also the co-chairs were, were saying in the introduction. What is your advice to an organization which sort of considers itself as a sort of a knowledge center which would like others to learn from our experience as we do within the OECD and now also engaging more and more developing countries in sharing our knowledge with them. So can we do that? Is that going to work? Is that learning uh, for learning? Thank you. We just have time for one more, I think, a quick one and then we'll let the professor. Yeah, as long as we don't answer them, but we will. You will answer them. You will answer them. Thank you. Um, Frédéric Roder from uh, the NGO One. I very much agree with your presentation and I think um, if, if we I mean, want to translate it into practice, we need to think about how we, uh, we design development cooperation programs to allow for this space to have this, um, what you call PDIA, I think. Um, but I just wanted to, um, to underline that um, you were speaking about the logistically low-hanging fruits um, we've been able to reach, but I think what we shouldn't uh, be forgetting is that uh, we st still haven't reached all these fruits. For instance, um, most young children in Africa still um, die of um, diseases that are preventable and we have vaccines for them. So um, I think it's just important not to forget about this. And um, I think it's, it's actually a huge failure of the development cooperation that we haven't been able to reach all these fruits. Thanks. I agree with most of what was said. Uh, I, I think, for instance, Korea is an example of a country that was able to do industrial policy of exactly the type that lots of other countries tried to do and failed. So Korea, and for reasons that lots of people debate about, was able to develop the capability to actually implement industrial policy without it turning into an orgy of rent-seeking and corruption. I think the key thing that gets missed is how was that capability built and constructed? And I think when you look at Korea, it was constructed socially and politically, not just as a policy. So again, I think we often look, we often think, and then, and that leads into the next question, is if what we mean by disseminating learning is, you know, seeing what trees grow successfully, cutting them off and taking them to another country without looking at the organic roots at how that tree developed, that is a very dangerous form of mutual learning. If, on the other hand, we can take the roots and say, here is how our country evolved into having the capability of doing what we're doing, how can that be relevant to your context, and we'll work together with you on that, that's an entirely different thing. But I think a lot of this is, is the learning are helping you be capable at nominating and solving problems as opposed to have we come to you with a tick box of solutions. Whereas our learning is our procurement works this way, therefore if you change your procurement law to look like our procurement law, that's learning. That is not learning. What learning is, is we eliminated corruption from procurement in our roads contracts we did it in this organic, political, social, and economic process of moving in this way. The outcome of that organic process was a certain sets of procedures. But what we want to help you with is your process in your country. That's mutual learning. And then st it's still the case only learning is learning. Only if, you know, I've had kids. My kids, my youngest is now 18. My transferring learning to them was not in hugely successful, frankly. <laughs> Most of what they learned, they learned by learning. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> it is wicked hard. It is wicked hard. <laughs> you just identified a wicked hard thing, helping your kids learn. Thank you very much. It's been very helpful. Uh, we take a break now, Federico? No, we, we oh, we'll have another panel. OK, thanks very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. We are starting our next session, which will be on infrastructure. We're going to talk about how to improve the effectiveness of spending, of public spending in infrastructure. We have a very distinguished panel here, and Deb Bhattachar is a chair. If you can take uh, a seat, please, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Are we all set? OK. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you can see, we had a very engaging, fantastic, thought-provoking session in the morning. And good thing always demands time. And so we are running a bit late. But I am going to, I'm assuring you that we are not going to be isomorphic mimicry here. We are definitely going to sabotage the camouflage. And we, what we are going to do here is problem-driven uh, iterative adaptation. And to do that, we do have a very fantastic, exciting, knowledgeable set of experts with us, covering a wide range of area of the investment Set, uh, or the public spending in the infrastructure. But we only have one shortfall over here. That is our capability to fight against time. So to do that, what I'm going to do as the first round of you know, iterative adaptation to cut down on the time allocation for each of the speakers. That's, now we are going to do a bit learning by learning in that way to articulate our views in a much more shorter time period. Uh, let, you have seen the notes which have been circulated to you. We are today going to discuss effective public spending, the case of infrastructure. So here you will see, in terms of infrastructure, where it is, although not evident, not been spelt out, but essentially we are talking about the physical infrastructure, maybe the hard part of the infrastructure not so much the soft part of inf infrastructure. But I will not limit our eminent speakers in terms of that they will have to talk about only physical part, but will not talk about the soft part if it is necessary. The second part of it is about effective public spending. But we all recognize that the financing of infrastructure has diversified and has become more innovative. And private sector has a role to play sometimes in conjunction with the public financing, sometimes separately. So if the speakers also feel it's, it's necessary to bring in the context of private financing, I think that will be properly legitimate in many ways. But let us start with our speakers here. The, the first person I would like to invite is the Madam State Minister for National Development Planning from Indonesia, Armida Alice Jahabana. And, you, and being a minister in a national government, she has, and particularly in the planning ministry, has possibly the best possible overview how the public spending, which is a significant part uh, for infrastructure, goes to that, is being dealt with, the national challenges, the institutional dimension, the sources of financing, anything else, what you'd like to say, Madam Minister. The floor is yours. Uh, how much time do I have? You have Only seven minutes. Okay. Uh, At least for so the start to start with to make the initial statement. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, how should I call you, Deb? Um, Deb. That's yes. fine. It means God. Right. <laughs> thank you very much. So, I have seven minutes yet to maybe to outline some uh, of of uh, uh, my thoughts on infrastructure development, especially as it relates to Indonesia. Uh, I think not only 
relevant for Indonesia, but also for other developing countries, emerging countries, including developed countries. Infrastructure certainly is key input to development. A rule of thumb is 5%. Yeah? 5% of GDP should be allocated or dedicated to infrastructure, and yet many, especially develop, developing countries, has not yet reached that, uh, that number. So that's uh, one of the issues, yeah? the, uh, the required investment needed for infrastructure development. Second, sources of infrastructure investment. Uh, of course, uh, the largest share, largest bulk, uh, comes, still comes from government, especially in emerging countries such as Indonesia. But even in Indonesia, if you look at the numbers, the data, uh, although still the largest share yeah, from government, but roughly speaking, one third from uh, central government, another one third uh, from state-owned enterprise and local government, and another one third from private sector. So how to combine yeah, uh, all the sources of infrastructure financing to, to be able to develop the infrastructure that we need. And third is, of course, yeah, this is a classic, yeah, classic problems, but again, a key and very important if we want to build a successful infrastructure development on the turnkey projects, certain turnkey projects, yeah and also uh, related to our priority in development. Uh, that is the coordination. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, a key word, yeah. Uh, looks easy, yeah, but yet that's uh, a very challenging in the implementation. Coordination between levels of government, countries such as, such as in Indonesia, not only relies on central government, but uh, since uh, we embark on decentralization 2001, a lot yeah, of the infrastructure development has to be done at the local level. So coordination between central government, provincial government, local government. And also since some of the sources of the infrastructure needs comes also from state-owned enterprise and private sector, uh, there needs to be a clear regulation yeah, to give uh, certainty on how uh, the private sector can also participate in the infrastructure development. We started to develop through the so-called uh, PPP mechanism, public-private partnership mechanism in infrastructure development, quite ambitious, but yet in the implementation, we, we still face uh, quite uh, big challenges. Yeah? Uh, maybe that has to do with the regulation that uh, is not yet able to give certainty yet to the private sector to be able for them to participate in the infrastructure development. So that's the big picture in Indonesia. And second big issue yeah, that I would like also uh, to share with you, uh, especially relate to our country, yeah, because uh, Indonesia is quite unique in the sense, yeah, if we, we want to develop infrastructure, then it is, I'm sure it is also quite unique, specific, uh, for each country. For example, it would be, of course, different if it is a landlocked country. It would be different if it is a uh, country such as Indonesia, an archipelagic country. Therefore, connectivity is key, uh, very important, the, the relate, uh, starting from the plan itself, yeah? how we want to develop the, all this mode of in, uh, infrastructure, public works, transportation, uh, what else, energy, yeah? IT, ICT, public housing for Indonesia. Because it is an island country, an uh, archipelagic country. Connectivity within one island, inter-island, and then uh, Indonesia and the rest of the region yeah, with ASEAN yeah, in this case. So that's another, another challenge. So with that, maybe I'll just stop. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Uh, just uh, if, you, if you allow me, I will just give one question to you, a uh, small one. Uh, you have mentioned the sources of financing, right, the diversification. Yeah. You have talked about the problems of both vertical and horizontal coordination. You have mentioned the pro challenges of regulation and then the uniqueness. Let me connect you to one particular issue which didn't come out so strongly. Is how does it affect the composition of the investment in the sense in different elements of the infrastructure? Does this uniqueness 
really make you more invest more in transportation and connectivity vis-a-vis, -vis, say, for example, electricity? Yeah. So is there any implication in terms of composition yeah. there? Yeah, certainly uh, it has implication, but uh, previously, yeah, because we do not yet uh, have a quite a good plan yeah, on this connectivity, what happened in Indonesia previously, yeah, in previous years, the infrastructure development tend to be more concentrated in public works, uh, pu public works. so more land transportation. Uh, of course, yeah, the majority of population may be concentrated in several islands only like Java, Sumatra. Yeah? So heavy infrastructure development went to roads, for example, yeah? but not that much attention was put on uh, sea transportation or air transportation, just only in the couple of uh, past few years uh, that we started to pay uh, more attention on this connectivity issue. But uh, of course now it's changing. Thank you very much for, for that supplementary information. Uh, I would like to call upon the Deputy President of the Brazilian National Development Bank, who are Carlos Ferraz, Ferraz, you, you sit at the top of the a National Development Bank, and obviously you have in involvement in the uh, infrastructure financing. One of the key issues is that when it is a national or state-owned bank, and what your bank is, I understand, uh, then how does it really complement or sometimes challenges the government policy on infrastructure financing? Is there any conflict apart from your own issues? That's one issue which would have interested me. Yes, um, I will touch upon, uh, upon that, uh, but my initial remark, I think uh, we should, given uh, that it's the 50th anniversary of the development center, I think we should put the development perspective in a sort of a strategic uh, outlook on, on infra uh, development. And, um, and I think that we should have in mind that when we talk about infrastructure development, uh, the key issue here is that the management of tensions is essential. If you are talking about, uh, if, if, you, if you take developing in a large perspective, uh, the process of economic inclusion that is going on in Brazil, for example, provides sort of immediately uh, a large consumption market so there will be more people consuming goods um, from food to television to cars. Uh, and it's the response of industry is relatively immediate to this increase in demand. Now, the response, the, the response of the infrastructure is much uh, uh, longer, yes? So in order to... Uh, provide cars, you need a factory that will take two years uh, to uh, build. In order to build a uh, hydroelectric plant, it will take longer. So the maturation process of economic inclusion, of consumption, of industrial production, infrastructure development, and even com uh, ca capacity building, the time horizon in each one of these is different. And um, the management of this tension of unbalanced growth is essential in a society that is prone uh, to grow. And this is the, the type of challenge that we have now, that we have gone through an economic inclusion, but it's still the time for, uh, for the maturation of large infrastructure projects is, is much longer, and it puts pressure on the society as a whole. And this, I mentioned this because we have to take into consideration something that is overlooked uh, when we talk about uh, infrastructure development, which is the cumulative process associated with infrastructure projects. Um, and, and this, I will tell you more or less a, a story that uh, I witnessed a few years ago uh, in relation uh, to Brazil. Brazil started its program of infrastructure development in 2007, f five years ago. And we, before that, we spent something like 25 years with no infrastructure development and investment at all. So it was a rusted machine. So we have five years of pushing, you know, uh, unrusting and uh, oiling the wheel from feasibility studies to the legal system to having the PPPs and to have the financing. Now, 
um, and it's slow, you know, we project and the government is pushing and it has not yet reached the 5%, uh, so we're pushing that. Now, in 2008, when the crisis came in the US, the Chinese which, uh, who were lending in the economy then, they said that they would uh, uh, um, uh, take off the economy again with a $600 billion in, uh, 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 investment package in infrastructure. When I read that, you know, and, uh, and, Benny and, and Brazil had one year of this thing going on, I said, no way, you know, it's going to take a long time. So we're not going to see this uh, Chinese miracle again. So this is in October 2008. In May 2009, I went to China, and I was talking to people there, and, and I said, how is the 600 billion package going? Everything is really going on. I said, wow, the Chinese are aliens, yes? The effectiveness and all that. And this friend said, no, 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 it's very simple. China has been growing for the past 30 years. So until recently, the uh, central government was telling the provincial government and the townships, please, just fire with your projects. We don't want projects anymore. Just fire with your projects. Fire your projects. Just, you know. And then when uh, the crisis came and they put the $600 billion, they said, bring projects back. And there was an immediate a stock of projects. The whole machinery was already willed so that they could then uh, proceed uh, with these investments in infrastructure. So my, point, my main point here in this moment is that uh, growth matter, cumulative growth matter, and persistence of growth and pushing investment, uh, investment in infrastructure as an element of, uh, of uh, uh, priority is very important. Now, going to your point, the development bank and how the development bank uh, works, and I think it's a nice question because it fits very much into what I was saying before. Basically, uh, Benny de S, no, which is a large institution, um, uh, the, uh, um, our budget for infrastructure has been growing at 20% um, a year in the past two to three years. And it's around 25 billion US out of a total 80 billion disbursement that Benny Des does. Now, if you compare, and basically most of our uh, financing for infrastructure is related to energy. Why energy? Because energy is done through concessions. So we finance the private sector that won a bidding over a concession somewhere, either wind or hydro or whatever. Now, we have uh, you know, our homework in terms of the infrastructure policy we have delivered most of what we're supposed to do in the time that we're supposed to do. Uh, why is that? Because there was a regulation that was clear. There was an investment group that was bidding for that. There was a financing package, an institution that was ready, they knew the guarantee and the system and the regulation. So there was the money there. Now, if you look on other infrastructures, sanitation, urban mobility, uh, especially on these two, that are uh, uh, carried out with the national budget. Wow, the difficulty, the number of agents that you were mentioning, Minister, the number of agents involved in this, it's much slower. So the machinery uh, in, uh, to provide financing for infrastructure development out of the budget, it runs into it's still a rusted machine, and we only have five years on this. Oh, thank you for very much. I think uh, that was a very fundamental point, that the <coughs> growth impact and the whether uh, there is an issue of, uh, you know, the cumulative effect of growth, the spillover, and situate it in the context of inclusive development. And uh, we know that the direct cumulative effect is also supplemented by 
uh, indirect impact in case of health and uh, uh, health and education because this infrastructure gives us better access to all those things including there are studies which will show how infrastructure has improved the security situation for individuals for, for their access to the police station which is can be accessed much more faster if necessary that was a very important point and the other point which comes out very interestingly if the state owned bank finances the private sector then possibly you avoid the crowding out implications, which is quite often there, that the money is drawn by the state to finance through its state level banks and does not necessarily crowd out the private sector. In this case, we see that the private sector essentially is financed by the state level bank. Is that a problem? Or you uh, have solved the problem? Uh, uh, no, the problem in Brazil is not crowding out. The problem is crowding in. <laughs> okay. yeah? The private sector does not finance long term. So we need the private sector to finance long term. So we're not crowding out. No, no, I understand. We lack the, the, the private sector to finance long term. This is, yeah, um, uh, this is very important. And because probably there is a, 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 a special uh, situation in Brazil where uh, the interest rates being high and the liquidity uh, of uh, public bonds, etc. There is no propensity in the economy for financing long term. Okay, thank you. I think uh, that is uh, one of the major conclusions which come out from all literature that investment by the uh, government in the infrastructure is usually the crowding in that creates the complementarity in many ways. But the problem arises if that re the liquidity is not available for the private sector to do the complementary activity. That's, uh, so let's move on. Uh, that was uh, two very good initial presentation. We now move to um, uh, Mr. David Morrison. Uh, he's the executive secretary of the UN Capital Development Fund. Uh, one would be very, very interested to know what UN has to do about it and what would be the sources of fund and how does it fit in into this whole financing architecture uh, for the infrastructure at the national level or for that matter regional or super regional activities. Please, the floor is yours, sir. I hope that, uh, there it goes. Well, thank you very much. Um, the, the, I think the point of departure for the, the UN here is the local level. Um, the UN Capital Development Fund focuses only on least developed countries. So 70% of the portfolio is in Africa and the remainder is mainly in, uh, in Asia with Haiti being the only country in the Americas. Um, and we provide very little financing because it's the UN and it's mainly technical assistance, but we like to think that we lay some of the groundwork for the larger players that can, um, that can come in afterwards and some of them are represented here on the, on the panel. I want to make um, two fundamental points. Um, one is about the availability of financing for infrastructure in the least developed countries. Uh, and the second is on the, uh, how to make certain that financing is used effectively and efficiently. So first on availability, clearly um, in the least developed countries, there's, a, there's huge unmet infrastructure needs and, and not sufficient finances. Uh, the, the chair suggested a moment ago that, you know, the needs that are unmet by the public sector can, of course, be met by the private sector, and, and we've just talked about crowding in. I, I want to say that one thing that we're doing at the United Nations is um, trying to pilot some work that will crowd in the domestic financial sector in least developed countries into small-scale infrastructural investments. Um, the, in the countries that we work in, the least developed countries, 70% of the economy tends to come from uh, agriculture, smallholder agriculture, and there are huge unmet infrastructure needs. Um, and they're never going to be met, frankly, through public sources of finance. So one of the things that we're starting to do in a couple of East African countries is we're trying to leverage in... Um, uh, domestic banks into infrastructure finance using techniques, uh, credit enhancement, risk mitigation that work at the $300 million level. We're trying to get them to work at the sort of $3 million level to meet some of these um, critical infrastructure needs. Um, 
and I'm happy to, to, uh, to talk a little bit more in the question and answer period about what we're doing on both the supply side and the demand side. It's a lot of technical assistance. It's a hand-holding of the banks. And fundamentally, it's hand-holding and uh, capability building of local authorities and in some cases, some case project sponsors if it's a structured finance uh, approach. The second point I want to make is, is of course, that um, even if there's more financing for infrastructure, the imperative has to be on making certain that that financing is well used, that it's spent efficiently and effectively. And here I want to pick up on the comments by the minister from Indonesia that there are huge um, coordination challenges across levels of government uh, in, in this case. And I want to make a plug uh, for the local level of government. We talked, we heard about isomorphic mimicry. We heard uh, Brian Atwood say at the end that uh, one way to prevent this is by uh, uh, working at the local level or having the, make, make certain we're listening to people's voices at the local level and, and designing programs appropriately. At UNCDF, we have, uh, decades of experience working at the local level, and we, we spend a lot of time on the financing of local governments to, um, to provide infrastructure. Now, there's a theoretical case for this, which has to do with um, allocative efficiency and actual spending effectiveness. Um, Anecdotally, if you ask uh, people in the, in the areas where we work, they'll say that they, they get better outcomes when decisions on infrastructure are made by local authorities rather than authorities at higher levels of government. And the literature also suggests savings in the, ra in the range of 5 to 10 percent if, uh, if decisions on infrastructure are taken locally. O obviously not, I mean, there's a difference between national roads and, and, uh, and, and feeder roads and so on. But the evidence seems to suggest that um, decentralization, as the minister from, from Indonesia said, can lead to better infrastructure decisions. But there, then you fall into the capability problem because capacities tend to be, um, tend to be weakest, obviously, at the local level of, of government. We spend a lot of time um, working with local governments on um, planning and uh, appropriate participatory planning mechanisms, appropriate strategic planning mechanisms for um, for infrastructure, and then working on the full cycle of public expenditure management. We've had great um, success with things like performance-based uh, grants coming from the central level that reward good investment performance um, at the local level. Um, we have done things like in, uh, in Cambodia, helping to uh, design the subnational finance law, which regulates how the money flows to investments, uh, as well as producing uh, subnational investment planning guides in, in, a, range of, uh, in a range of countries. Uh, it's not easy because of the capacity challenges, um, but it's incredibly important because people live at the local level in, in the countries where we, where we operate. Final point that I'll make is that climate change makes all of this even more difficult because it's imperative that not only is the, uh, do we meet unmet infrastructure needs, but we need to take account at the local level of the likely impact of climate change, which often implies um, higher costs to climate proof uh, coming infrastructure investments. So that's a whole new area of work that we're, uh, that we're looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Mr. Morrison. Uh, if I understand right, that basically UN, uh, this Capital Development Fund, is leveraging uh, the other initiatives which are going on, addressing some of the market failures, even at the lower level, <coughs> and, and you will also engage in giving partial guarantees to the private sector performance and others. So it just, uh, in, a sh in short, how, how do you address the market failures in the local level in terms of infrastructure spending? Uh, what are the tools? Well, we have uh, we have um, uh, on the on the we have two legs. One is on the public financing side, and one is on the private uh, financing side or public private. On the
public financing side, I, I've, I've just tried to explain yeah. that where the, where the money is available, we help to try to ensure that it's spent efficiently and effectively and so on. The tools for the private side or the public-private side, uh, you know, we're frankly just developing them, but they, they're the ones that you mentioned, partial guarantees, um, uh, you know, uh, pooled funding, taking, taking first loss, all of the tried and true project financing mechanisms that work, as I said, at the level of $300 million, but they, they there's two reasons that they're not currently prevalent at, at the local level. One is simply the transaction costs. This is very uh, high touch work and that makes it expensive. But the second, and this is really the problem that we're interested in solving, is the risk perception by local uh, financial institutions. It could be this work is really risky or it could be that there's just a perception that it's really risky. We are the UN, another part of our business, we are the United Nations microfinance agency. And if you think of you know, microfinance, before there was microfinance, it was considered too, risk, too risky to lend to poor people. It's currently considered too risky to lend to a local government if it's a project sponsor. So we're trying to work at that level to reduce the risk perception. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time to move on to the two very eminent pe persons who, have, uh, who represent the regional development financial institutions. And so we got the UN perspective, we got the national bank's perspective, and of course the policymakers' perspective. But uh, how does the perspectives, uh, how do they differ from the perspectives of the regional development banks? And their, what is their comparative advantage uh, along with the regional schemes they pursue? So I would like to invite Dr. Mutili Nkube, He's the chief economist and vice president of the African Development Bank. I, I largely agree with what has been said by, <clears throat> by my colleagues uh, up, up here, the minister, and, and the, my two colleagues to my left and right. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of infrastructure in Africa is, is real, um, perhaps more real than in any other region. In Nigeria alone, power outages account for 30% loss in productivity. We also know that the deficit of about $50 billion a year which goes unfunded in Africa in terms of infrastructure deficit, uh, 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 accounts for something like 3% loss in GDP growth. So if you just close that gap, GDP growth could move even, even, even higher. It's a real, and, and the bank is doing a lot in the infrastructure space. Certainly, if we're not in infrastructure, we wouldn't be in business, really. Uh, that's the elephant in the room. And, and there, are, there, there are a few constraints uh, that, that, that we come across. First of all, I mean, it is human, it is financial, it is also uh, special. Uh, on the human front, just the ability to get people to think through projects, project preparation and so forth at the government level, that, that capability is missing. We, 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 we are just meeting challenges in terms of capable governments. So we spend a lot of time financing project preparation and want to expand that, that facility, uh, working with our colleagues in Washington, the, the World Bank. Um, uh, the other is obviously capacitating the project implementation units in the ministries of infrastructure or wherever they, they, they are sitting. Uh, you know, they, they, need, they need a lot of capacity in understanding projects, getting them done, working with partners uh, in, in terms of public-private partnerships. That, 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 that's a lot of work to do there. But also in getting governments to, to, to set the right policy environment for infrastructure to, to, to you know, for investors to invest in, 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 in infrastructure. So all those are some of the, the environmental constraints. And the other constraints are obviously financial. The largest invest in infrastructure right in Africa is China, followed by the African Development Bank and closely by, by the World Bank. And that actually tells the story about the, the absence of, of, a, of a strong private sector that can provide long-term funding, which what Zhao was mentioning and, and David added to. Uh, so China then comes in handy to do that. We fall in so 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 that does, 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 does the World Bank. Of course, the tran Chinese transactions they tend to be nuanced with their resources, resource extraction. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, Africa does need those roads, by the way. So are more sympathetic to the Chinese approach that, 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 that than most uh, 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 people. So so finance is is a challenge in terms of the the domestic uh, promotion and deepening of domestic capital markets. Again, I agree uh, uh, with what David said about. Uh, pro, uh, uh, promoting, you know, uh, uh, locally financed, uh, uh, locally local investment. 
And here I, I can think of a, an example of Kenya where they've launched a, an infrastructure bond, domestic infrastructure bond. And the bank has come up with a program to see if this could be rolled into other parts of Africa. So we have, infra we have domestic participation in, in, in infrastructure uh, financing. The other constraint, of course, is, is spatial. Uh, Africa is, what, 54 countries. We even created another country six months ago, South Sudan. Um, and, 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 and half of these countries are landlocked. And we've got a lot of small countries, countries with 200,000 people, 400,000, a million people. Large, large pieces of land with a million people. So connecting these countries together, the regional nature of the infrastructure challenge in Africa is real. So it, it makes infrastructure very difficult to roll out for, for very few people, large tracts of land. It, it's just so expensive. So, so that, that's a big challenge, but we have to keep, keep going, keep, keep going at it. So the need for regional infrastructure uh, uh, strategies is important. Then you run into another problem, which is, at a regional level, who is your contracting party? If you're trying to do a P, a regional P, 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 uh, they have the capacity to contract, negotiate, and, and, and implement jointly with you those kind of projects. Th those are some of the challenges that we face. Certainly, we, uh, we, we, are, we are pushing wherever we can uh, uh, China to, to uh, do more regional projects as opposed to national projects. And they face the same challenges, which is easier to deal nationally than regionally, because regionally, you run into this contracting capacity uh, uh, issue. One little point, you know, the, there is something called the sustainable lending limit, which is um, international financial institutions speak from the IMF and, and so forth, that uh, you know, there's a limit in terms of what the country looks like in the macro sense, limit to how much it can you know, spend, uh, indeed borrow. That's a serious constraint, by the way. For, for, for rolling out infrastructure by governments. In, in fact, it is one country which I, which I will not mention in Africa, which needs infrastructure badly. Uh, we had to, to break every rule to approve a bridge last week, the, the, because of a bridge, why? They had reached their sustainable lending limit. We had reached our exposure in terms of that country, in terms of the S&P, Moody rating, because as a bank, we're a triple-A bank, we don't want to lose our credit rating. So we protect that as well. You, and you look at it, and meanwhile, just next door, China is just funded, and the, the country just wanted for $50 million from us, frankly. That, that's all. Uh, sustainable lending limit, limit sounds like $30 million. And, and China, next door, another project, had just spent $2 billion, or just about. So, so you have these uh, cake rules that apply and constrain MDBs, international institutions, governments, and yet there are other ways to finance infrastructure, so there's need to innovate. Uh, let me stop here for now. Yeah, yeah just one small point. I, I'm just intrigued by the fact that uh, you are uh, leaving the space for the regional projects to China and the African Development Bank concentrating more on national level projects. I thought it was the comparative advantage of the African Development Bank being an intergovernmental organization to concentrate more on regional projects in, in relative terms. Did no, I understand you right? No, no, not quite. You didn't get me right. Uh, what, what we're saying is that we are encouraging uh, whoever we're engaging with as partners, including China, to go more for regional projects. They've just got more resources for, uh, because these are expensive projects. They have more resources than us to deploy, frankly. But we are also doing quite a lot of, of, of regional uh, projects. Uh, financing and would like to do more. The constraint everyone faces is this quality of the regional contracting party. The regional institutions are not strong enough to drive these projects through and, and, and see them through. So you don't see complementary institutional building at the inter-regional level, which can really uh, complement your financing approach with other technical approaches? Well, absolutely, I agree with you. There's a need to build those regional institutions, uh, create maybe special purpose institutions for ports, for one-stop border ports, for, for roads that cut across countries, for, for corridors of roads, corridors of rail. We are working hard to do that. It's not easy. We have to coordinate governments. In the end, we find that as an MDB, you end up running the secretariat for the regional organization in the bank, but it should be run in the countries somewhere, house somewhere. So those are some of the institutional challenges about regional capabilities and, and, and state and, and, and government capability. Thank you. Well. Mr. U Chung Um, how is the life in Asia? Can I go there? Yes, please do. You have PowerPoints? No, no, no. I just, can you hear me? Oh, okay. okay.
there's a reason why I'm standing here because um, for two reasons. One is sitting and I can't see this side of the, the, the audience, so I want to see everyone. And second, in this part of the world, when ADB comes here, usually they confuse ADB with African Development Bank. So <laughs> I want to make sure that, you know, very clearly we're from Asia. So <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, I was supposed to give a, for that reason, I was supposed to give Not a two minute introduction on what ADB is all about. But since the moderator cut, cut my time down by one minute, let me go straight into the question of what are the challenges that the Asian governments are facing in addressing the infrastructure needs. Actually, the answer is very, very, very straightforward. Um, there is not enough money to meet all the needs of the infrastructure uh, development in, in our region. In our recent study, it indicates that we need about $8 trillion of investment in infra infrastructure by 2020. And if you add up all ADB, World Bank, all the domestic resources that we have talked about yesterday, you're not going to reach anywhere near. I mean, for example, ADB's lending annually goes about uh, $10 billion in infrastructure. World Bank's about $23 billion and so on and so forth, we're just scratching um, in the margins. So it is very, very easy to define the challenge, but the solution, it takes a long time to discuss. And since we only have um, five minutes or so, uh, let me just focus on two issues uh, based on some of the things that are mentioned here. Uh, first is investing at the, in the right type of infra infrastructure so that our money goes as far as we can. And second is about mobilizing private sector, crowding in the private sector, both in terms of the money as well as knowledge. The first on the right kind of investment, let me give some examples of what I mean on this one. Uh, transport sector accounts for the largest share of ADB's lending every year for the last 46 years been around. About 30% of our investment goes into transport, of which 80% went into roads and highways. That's consistent with the minister from Indonesia uh, she has mentioned. Now, of course, the roads and highways are very, very important for um, economic development. But the question is, are we investing, are those the right, the, the best options to address the, the problem? Now, the, we have to look at what, what does this roads and highways do? Um, it helps move cars and trucks, vehicles. Now, in order for the countries to become economically competitive, we have to make sure that the people and goods are moved efficiently um, along with the transport, uh, along with the cars and trucks. So by building uh, transport systems that's pre predominantly roads and highways are we helping the cars and trucks but not so much on the people. So we decided to make a paradigm shift in terms of embracing more uh, multimodal uh, transport systems that involves, of course, the roads and highways, but also the railways, the, the waterways, as um, Indonesia might be planning to do in terms of connecting the intercities but also for the efficient urban transport, including the mass rapid systems, the LRTs, and the BRTs, um, and <clears throat> even promoting some of the non-motorized transport methods, like the transport, the, the bicycle ways, as well as the, the walkways, mm -hmm. and which are also very, very helpful in making our, in making our development much more inclusive, as well as it's very helpful in fighting against climate change in terms of greenhouse gas um, emissions um, since the transport sector is a sleeping giant that will have a biggest impact in, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So in the midst of all this, um, ADB, we also have to fight um, this, um, this perception from some countries that we are going through mild schizophrenia because um, in the 80s when we were actually, when we started the operation in our China business, we were building a lot of roads so that people can move from the bicycles to the cars. And then now we're telling them to get out of the cars and go back into the bicycles. And hopefully that can happen as, as successfully as we've done the other way around. Now, the other examples also exist in uh, water and um, energy sector. I'm just giving some examples so we can discuss more in others. Now, we, are very, we were very focused on building power plants as well as water treatment plants. Again, those are very, 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 very important. But also, we have to look at how efficiently we are using, the country's using the, the resources. So in the case of water, if a country, if a city is experiencing a non-revenue water of over 50% or the water loss of 50%, what's the point in building additional capacity for treatment of water? We have to fix the leakage from the pipes. In the energy sector, you also have to look at the demand side as well as the supply side efficiency so that we can achieve the maximum efficiency level. Um, and also regional cooperation, one of the um, points mentioned by our colleague in, in Africa that you know, we do need to support regional cooperation, despite the fact that oftentimes there, may, there are conflicts within the neighboring countries, but we have to look over that and be able to help each other in meeting the energy needs, for example, 
uh, by power trade by using the, the different peak times. So without having to generate any, any additional um, kilowatt of uh, energy or electricity, we can actually meet our demand significantly. So that's the first point. The second point is about mobilizing private sector crowding in. Um, we often refer to ourselves, ADB, as the $15 billion bank. That's the total lending uh, we achieved a couple of years ago. But we are asking, can we reach a $100 billion bank because the resource needs to be mobilized uh, along with ADB's uh, own resources? And this is a very driving force behind our public-private partnership initiative, the PPP initiative that we are going through, just getting started, actually. So how, the key question is, how can we maximize the, the use of our scarce resource? And in this, we needed, we needed to, you know, our primary lending, uh, our primary vehicle for development is lending program. Now, before, until now, our lending, the L is lending. But we need to leverage, change the L to leverage, uh, not just the traditional lending, per se. So. Our, our mandate now is to maximize the use of our own resources to maximize the participation of the private sector, both from the knowledge style as well as the, um, the financial side. Again, we have numbered very good uh, examples. Uh, one example in, in the last uh, five, six years was between ADB and the World Bank. We worked together to develop a hydropower project in Laos, a small country, which needed about $1.5 billion of investment. And ADB and the World Bank individually mobilized about $120 million each, a uh, combination of lending as well as guarantee products to leverage $900 million plus from commercial, um, international, uh, international commercial banks. Now, if you, can, if you can achieve this kind of um, leverage in a country like Laos, uh, certainly we can do it in other places as well. And, and that would actually be a huge step towards achieving our $100 billion a year ambition. Now, as I mentioned, this is not just about money. We have to mobilize private sector knowledge uh, because private sector is largely known to be much better equipped to manage large-scale infrastructure. So keeping all these things in mind, ADB's public-private partnership initiative actually has four pillars. First is about raising the, the advocacy. Um, it is a very, very important step that we need to raise the awareness of the countries of the opportunities that they have in the PPP modality. And second is creating an enabling environment, uh, developing policy, legal, and institutional framework, which will allow the private sector to feel much more comfortable in putting money in investing in the long-term investment, as I mentioned earlier as well. And third is something that we haven't done too much is yet, is the project development. In Asia, we often talk about opportunity for investment, but why isn't money flying through? Uh, that's because we don't have enough bankable projects. We have plenty of project concepts. So we do need um, ADB, World Bank, and others, and the countries need to help develop, turn these project concept, concepts into bankable projects so that private se sector can take over. And lastly, about project finance. That's um, the ultimate goal. So all this translates into um, our collective effort in helping the capacities to be developed in our developing country. And this is very consistent with the OECD strategy to help the knowledge sharing program to go in. And we feel that that's a very, very good start to move in this direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, just a small question. You see, going back to this regional approach coming from the Regional Development Bank and what uh, uh, Dr. Nkube has mentioned, one of the points was that that even if you arrange financing as such, but to negotiate coordinate uh, intergovernmental negotiation is a challenging thing. Now, in case of Asian Development Bank, we do have this uh, one of this showcase model that is Mekong uh, Delta Cooperation Mechanism. How was this particular point, this challenge or the gap between the two, was met? In a very, in <coughs> I would expect a couple of sentences on that. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, Actually, the example I gave on the hydropower is part of the regional cooperation initiative. Before any investment could actually take place, we, we spent close to 10 years helping the countries to have a common understanding of the needs and benefits. And before this investment, uh, which was actually an ex export, electricity export project from Laos to Thailand, we were able to establish an agreement between the two countries to, to trade 18 
thousand megawatts of power during a, a period of time. And, of, and within that umbrella, we were able to actually have this project and along with few, several others to come in. So there's a need for a tremendous amount of discussion at the country level and organizations like the AFDB and ASDB can play a very important role being the honest broker. Sort of you can say, well, you trust me and you know, this will work and everyone will be happy. And I think that's a quite important step. Thank you. Tenacity, my friend. Tenacity and patience <laughs> on that and predictability. I, I think we, we have heard very good five presentations from five different perspectives. It was very, very illuminating. It was based on uh, ground level knowledge and also their personal experience and expertise. I will open the floor, but before that, I am not being able to control myself from asking one question to the Madam Minister. Madam Minister, you have heard the regional development banks, the national banks, and the UN system. They're all there to help you. Are you happy with that? Depends on the size of the check, yeah? Right, yes. So um, then we will open the floor after your response. Yes. Um, uh, to, to respond to your question, um, maybe I would like to uh, reflect back a, li uh, a little bit on the, uh, our experiences with our development partners. Uh, we have worked a lot with our development partners, both multilateral as well as bilateral. So multilateral such as World Bank, ADB, and also IDB, Islamic Development Bank. Yes. That started also to, to go into infrastructure projects, as well as bilateral such as uh, previously JICA, JBIC. Yeah. Especially JICA, JBIC, uh, that, uh, we, we uh, work a lot with uh, the Japanese. And uh, that was uh, until several years ago but not that much anymore, yeah, because we have shifted our priorities. Uh, in, in, in terms of our develop, development cooperation, de development cooperation with our development partners, our principles are uh, threefold. The yeah, first is to support uh, capacity building uh, in areas of capacity building, whether it's of infrastructure or uh, hard infrastructure, yes, such as uh, the physical infrastructure one. And second is also if uh, it's involved the, our development partners, then uh, it has to also to support in certain projects such as uh, to leverage further investment from the development uh, partner countries, yeah, especially bilateral. So those are the principles. And uh, Did you always course, get their money when you needed it? Uh, yeah, of course. But uh, used to be we rely yeah, uh, very much uh, on, on this kind of infrastructure projects to build our capacity in the management and also to build quality infrastructure. But as our capacity also in, in developing infrastructure increases, then we rely more and more you know, on, on our own capacity. But then now we we then shifted a little little in certain areas such as energy, especially for renewable energy to develop certain projects, uh, for example geothermal with World Bank, and also to support in our PPP development capacity building, and also to support our uh, master plan in connectivity. So it's quite limited, yeah and not that full-fledged, full-scale full uh, projects that are involved. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me open the floor. Where is, oh, oh, you are talk. Yes, definitely. You are now going to give your question at the cost of your own coffee time. Please carry on. Thank you. My name is Ji Hei Ha. I'm working for uh, OECD Development Center. Uh, I'm very interested in Indonesian case. And thank you, uh, Minister Ali Savana, uh, for the overviews in Indonesia. Uh, my interest is focused on public-private partnership projects 
uh, projects on transport sector. Um, does Indonesia have any difficulties or challenges for policy coordination among different institutions? For example, uh, in one project, there's uh, lots of ministers involved in, for example, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Public Works, or sometimes local government. And how does Indonesia deal with uh, the uh, uh, policy, policy coordination among these institutions. Thank you. I, I think the question is very clear. Policy coordination okay. involving uh, multiple is there any ministries. Guide? Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, there are <coughs> there are two philosophies of infrastructure. So, would you introduce yourself for the? Uh, yeah, I'm Vito that. Tanzi. I was one of the speakers yesterday. Uh, there are two philosophies of uh, infrastructure building. One is that uh, infrastructure building leads growth. You need infrastructure so that growth will follow. This, for example, in many countries there is this kind of thinking. The other one is that uh, infrastructure ac accommodates growth. You know, it eliminates bottlenecks. So this goes back to Hirschman's view of the 1950s that you build projects where the bottlenecks have developed. Now, my first question is, which one of these philosophy guides the decision on the part of these various parts? And the, the related question, nobody mentioned benefit-cost analysis. Is this still used? Thank you. Yes. Uh, the only the cost part and both the benefit part has been expanded now with many other elements, possibly. Uh, any more? On the left side, please. Possibly the last one. I'm Hua Chen, uh, uh, Emerging Countries Fund Manager from Netixis. May I just ask a um, little more details about the private sector participation? Um, firstly, besides financing, which kind of contribution does government expect from private sector? Secondly, uh, what are the difficulties when you try to encourage private sector to participate in infrastructure project? Thank you. If you allow me, I will. There is nobody who is really dying to fix the infrastructure at this moment anymore, I hope. So if that be the, yes, sir. <laughs> You're right to speak. Half a minute, sir. Okay, uh, not question, just comments about the role of the state banks, uh, crowding or crowd issue. Uh, I'm from, uh, uh, my name is Hiroto Arakawa. I'm from JICA, Japan. Uh, we had a uh, seminar in uh, October last year about the infrastructure investment and its financing, not only fiscal but also financial uh, capital market as well development. And in this uh, session, uh, the IMF made a presentation on the role of financing. And in that context, the IMF paper suggests that the, it's a context dependent. I mean, uh, the role of the state banks are really there. That's a quite, uh, you know, the quite different from what uh, we have been uh, uh, hearing uh, for the past many years. Yeah, that's my comments. Thank you very much for that comment, Hiroto Um I will now close this panel. I have three questions, and I will distribute it amongst the five panelists, one minute each. The first question, and I will move from this side to the other. Yes, we need a microphone, definitely. Okay. Uh, to scale up the voice, yes. Uh, the first question was very direct, uh, direct to you, madam. So would you take that up, that regarding the, uh, the coordination okay. challenge? That was the, the lady's <coughs> question. Okay, so I answer directly, yeah? Yes, please do. Yeah. On, on uh, the question on the coordination problems in, in PPP implementation, we already divided up yeah, the, among the um, uh, related ministry, a so-called back office is us, Ministry of National Development Planning, that has to produce the list of the projects yeah, to be offered for PPP. Ministry of Finance, of course, they, uh, they task calculate risk and provide the guarantee and support, the government guarantee support if it is needed. And then the investment coordinating board is the front office, they do the marketing. And of course, the project preparation is the uh, responsibility of the line, res respective line ministry. So that's how we divide it up. 
You don't need the uh, intervention of the Prime Minister to solve those problems. We don't have Prime Minister. No, so the President for that uh, matter. We, well, what we have is a Coordinating Minister, so okay. they chair, he chaired the meeting. Okay, thank you. The next question was about this philosophy Professor Tanzer raised in that, do you promote growth or you accommodate growth? Uh, so uh, I will yeah. go from the national uh, and the I'll, regional I'll, perspective. I'll do just one phrase on taking two or three points. I think it's a push and pull, mm -hmm. Mr. Tanzer. I think uh, it pushes growth and it pulls growth. Cost benefits, absolutely necessary. Uh, more sophisticated than the numbers because the externalities associated with that and the benefits and the, uh, uh, and the negative externality must be considered. On the private sector um, participation, not only on the financing side, but also they may be the operators, but in one side that is not touched much is the supply industry all the engineering, the capital goods, and the service associated with that. So the private sector has a large role to play besides financing. Um, and um, the comment uh, by Jack, uh, it goes without saying. Dr. Inkube, on the philosophy of your financing uh, infrastructure? Well, let's frankly believe that uh, infrastructure leads growth. That, that's what we believe in. That's why we, we care about it. But of course, you know, may, maybe, maybe the, the real answer depending on what we believe, that is what we believe, it's much more nuanced. Maybe the causal nexus is, is in both directions. If you're intervening in a city like Nairobi to build a bypass road uh, because of congestion, uh, certainly you are responding to some growth pressure, yeah. and it's necessary. Uh, but also, if I'm going to, to, to build a, a proper road between Mombasa and Nairobi from the port, I'm also leading. I'm saying that, look, if there's a better road, a better trade, Trucks will move faster. It's all positive. So, so maybe in reality it's both. But as a bank, we believe infrastructure leads growth. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Morrison and Mr. Um, both of you on that the private sector issue, which was raised in that way. Just very quickly, I don't think it's um, it's just financing. It's know-how, it's knowledge, and it's innovation. I think that's what you get out of uh, public-private partnerships. <clears throat> on the you know, from our perspective, the. The private sector would like ADB to sort of handle some of the risks that they cannot, they cannot handle. And that's largely the political risk uh, which they uh, would like to do. So we oftentimes use the political risk guarantee, which addresses the currency convertibility issue, the breach of contract issue. Uh, but beyond that, when we, get, when we do get involved with any kind of project in whichever capacity, uh, we do have a relationship with the, the host governments. Uh, and that kind of gives them kind of warm and fuzzy feeling for the private sector to come in as well. Thank you very much. Let me just get the four or five messages which have come through from this meeting uh, to this panel. I think the first message which has come out is that uh, the financing infrastructure is a real issue. It's a priority issue. And for some country, possibly an existential issue. And the second point, the sub point to that is that most of these projects are underfinanced. There is an unmet demand both in terms of financing and also in terms of where the liquidity will come from. So the challenge for getting more resources for finance, for infrastructure is an ongoing issue and it will become more and more important as we move and in, with new problems along associated with it. So the scaling up is an issue, this both in terms of scope and its um, scale. The second issue which has come out is that the, the sources of financing for infrastructure uh, is broadening. We are getting a lot of new sources, not only from the government, but also within the country domestic sources, the local and the community level financing, the local government over there. The private sector is coming in, and also the blend, the mis mix of the private and the public is there. And we, we have not discussed here the other tools which are there, the, the bond which is being floated in many countries to raise special fund for financing um, infrastructure, the, the, the specific target-oriented bond flotations and other things over there. And we also did not speak so much today, didn't, because of the brevity of time, uh, is the role of the foreign direct investment in these cases. That part was also not largely addressed because of the time problem. I think we have also addressed the issue of the changing composition of the, of the, of the infrastructure financing. Uh, but we have seen that the connectivity, the transport part, still dominates. And studies will show that it, that it is the sign of low level of development. Uh, 
Usually the middle income country and the thereafter, you will see more investment in electricity. Power area, as, as it goes, it moves from connectivity to power and then to other new types of technologies and others associated with the soft part and other, including which we did not discuss today, again, on that composition part, is information and communication technology, the ICT, or the clean or green energy growth infrastructures and other things. Again, it's not because, it's also because we didn't have enough time. The third issue which came out very strongly is the coordination problem. Coordination both at the national level within the government, the coordination with the national government with the local government, the coordination amongst the countries for regional projects, which was very, very highlighted over here, and also between the coordination between the development partners and the national governments and other entities. So coordination, both vertical, horizontal, intergovernmental, special, these are all very, very important issues which has come through. The third, uh, fourth, fifth issue is that regulation and enforcement. Uh, this has been referred to in connection with PPPP. Uh, PPPP is, uh, is essentially his prime minister's preferred project, isn't that so? <laughs> or, or the politically preferred projects. It depends how you put those PPP. And, and, but that is a major area where there are a lot of discussion as we go. And here the performance criteria, the indicators uh, along which one will build not only the allocation but also the implementation part is, is very much uh, important over here. The uniqueness of, of the country context is, has been also highlighted, particularly for an archipelago country with a lot of islands. The country I live close to is Maldives of the similar nature, a lot of small islands. You have the, also the other country I live close to is Nepal, where you people live in the mountainous region where for two households you have to bring the water and the electricity city over there. The last but not the least, the two issues which came up but we couldn't discuss very long more, is the new tools which are coming in. PPP is one of those, bonds is one of those, but also the preparation of the projects is a pre-project investment has been Im highlighted. The international agencies are putting in a lot of their money in there. But also the other issue which was partly given to us uh, by Mr. Morrison is the climate change, the new risks which are coming in, and how infrastructure will adapt to that. The sustainability of infrastructure and the implication of infrastructure spillover for sustainable development. I'm very surprised that none of the panelists have raised the issue of corruption or the, or the erosion of value of the money, because in most countries, in developing countries, the large Corruption cases are always associated with infrastructure deals. Maybe that's for the next time. Thank you very much. Have your coffee. Uh, sorry, an housekeeping announcement. Coffee is outside. Uh, please be brief, because we're going to start immediately with the, with the round table. So uh, let's say five, maximum eight minutes coffee break. Thank you.